I'm Josh Eiler. Uh, I work at the University of Mississippi right now, where I'm leading uh, the faculty development initiatives and also a university-wide critical thinking initiative for general education courses. So uh, in juggling a couple of balls, you know. Um, but uh, most before I uh, came to University of Mississippi, I was at Rice University in Houston for about six years, where I directed their teaching center. I was at George Mason before that. Uh, associate director in their teaching center and I began my career as a tenured English faculty member at Columbus State University in Georgia which is a mid-sized regional comprehensive university very diverse really enjoyed all the teaching that I did there uh, it really made an impact on how I see education and the power of education um, simply because it was very evident at that university the impact that great teaching had on individual students' lives. And so after I got tenure, I decided what I wanted to really do was move into teaching and learning initiatives more broadly so that we could try and scale that experience for students around the country. So from that point on, I've really been working at research universities on teaching intensive initiatives uh, across the university. Um, and as I moved into, uh, as I moved into that work, um, I was uh, coming up against the same questions all the time. I was learning more and more about different disciplines uh, with which I wasn't familiar at the start and their teaching methodologies and practices. I kept running into the question, not what works, because we actually have a canon of effective teaching practices, I think, by this point. But the question I had was, why? Why do some things work and others not work? What is it about the way human beings learn that makes some teaching strategies land for some students and other teaching strategies fall short. And that sent me uh, on uh, this wild and woolly five-year journey uh, to write uh, this, uh, a book that eventually became How Humans Learn. And I dove into a number of dis different disciplines that we're going to talk about today um, that uh, are doing a lot of great work and have been doing a lot of great research on how people learn for a very long time. But what I was noticing is that they very seldom were talking to each other. So cognitive neuroscience, developmental psychology, educational psychology, evolutionary biology, they're all studying different pieces of this puzzle, of this question, but rarely interacting and combining uh, what, they're, what they're studying and almost never utilizing that information to improve the way we teach in college classrooms, which is really my mission. The more we know about how people learn, the better teachers we can be. And so this is uh, what today's uh, kind of workshop is really rooted in. Before I dive in, I just want to make, uh, make two comments about what we're going to talk about today. I always love to really you know, bring happiness to audiences. We're going to talk about really happy topics like fail failing and making mistakes and, and errors. And I could have used any one of those terms. I could have used error. I could have used mistakes. But I'm consciously and intentionally using the term failure here because it's important uh, for our students and for, I think, the, the future of education that we destigmatize that term. And the only way we're going to do that is to use it and to frame our use of that term in ways that are productive for the teaching and learning relationship. So that's first thing. Second thing, the kind of failure I'm talking about here are the, are the sorts of failures, both big and small, that you might see in, uh, in a course over the, uh, over the span of an individual semester. One course, one semester. What I'm not talking about here are, uh, I'm not talking about allowing students to just fail courses willy-nilly and, 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 and sort of uh, bouncing back from that. There are people who look at those kinds of things but uh, that's not the approach I'm taking. I'm talking about teaching and learning problems, errors, mistakes that we see over the course of the semester, and how we can reframe those and utilize failure as learning opportunities. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Be a little bit of, uh, of uh, kind of presenting you with research and a little bit of interaction so you can talk to each other and think about how this all works with your own courses and your own students. So. With that, I want to ask you a question, and I don't want you to be humble, and I don't want you to be modest. I want you to think of something that you are good at individually. You are really good at. It doesn't have to be academic. In fact, it works better if it's not. So think of something you're really good at. Give you a couple seconds. 
And now I want you to think of how you got good at that thing. What was the process that you went through to get good at that? Right? Another few seconds. I'm going to ask you a couple of volunteers. Who wants to go? Okay. Uh, I do you hear me? I, I prepare uh, future foreign language teachers, English teachers. Great. And I think that over the years I have um, become good at uh, planning a student center activities and moving students around. Okay. And the way that I learned that was by failure. Okay. Yeah, what do you mean because by that? I was well, I was very boring. Teacher center. <laughs> Nobody talked. Yeah, and I realized but I, I, I have to I, I have cheated the system. I came up with a, with a model that I have used for myself over mm -hmm. the years, a self assessment of teaching observation. So I have, by observing myself, I still do. I still observe myself every class I teach. I look at the colors. I look at the way that I move my hands. I look at my voice. I look at the mistakes. Great. But I'm, I'm learning. So thank you. All right. Thank you. It's almost as if I planted you in the audience to say that. <laughs> Who else wants to go? What are you good at? And how did you get that way? Okay, in the back. Oh, thank you. Visual demonstration. Oh, there we go. Okay. I happen to be very good at crocheting, and I have a, a hand trimmer now that it really helps me stay still. But I started when I was five, and I have just continued since then. So you think how old I am now, all of 21, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah, that's what it was. It was just tons and tons of doing this. But now I can be, I'm considered a master crocheter now. Okay. So starting when you were five and lots and lots of practice, right? Excellent. Who else? Okay. Was your hand going up? Yeah, but my answer is the same as hers. Crocheting? Crochet. Okay. <laughs> well, that's okay too. I'm, I'm a pretty good cook. You know, mm -hmm. and the way I got good at it is um, by cooking and by eating. Right, okay. <laughs> also practicing. When you were learning to cook, did you ever burn anything? Okay, some burned dishes along the way. Anyone else? One last one? What are you good at? See, this is also useful for learning about your colleagues, right? Cooks and crochets. Anyone else? Okay. I, I am a pretty good slackliner. Slackliner, what is that? Um, like tightrope wa wa walking, but on flat nylon webbing. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I, I have highlined. I, I did walk between two cliffs. Safely attached. Uh -huh. um, I got that way <clears throat> lots of time. Um, I thought it was really important to set minimal goals. I was terrible at okay. the beginning, and I decided that if I could just stand up and take, get my other foot on the line, mm -hmm. I would consider that a success, okay. even though I wanted to do much bigger things, as long as I could do that much consistently, anything else was a bonus. Excellent. Now let me ask you a question. Did you start off by walking between two cliffs? No. no. Okay. Where did you start? Um, in between two trees. In between two trees. Off the ground. All right. Okay. Important. This is all important context. Your hand was going up. Do you want to share? I thought I thought I was going to say I'm really good at like getting out of raising my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm really good at catching hands as they're yeah. going up. Yes. Um. I'm. This is weird. I'm really good at talking to young children, like toddler, like three to five, because I have taught in preschools for that long and that's why I'm here. I'm like a graduate teacher trainer. Okay. Um, I don't I, like, I don't know why I'm like so good at it and I can get them engaged except I do know why because when I first started teaching I was awful. Like I would ask my class a question and they would just like stare at me and not talk to me and we wouldn't have these conversational right. turns. And now 11 years later, like I really am able to talk to any toddler, even if they, like, I'm a, I shouldn't say talk, I'm able to have conversational turns with any toddler, whether they can communicate or not, and just for me, meeting them just barely. Okay. 
Yeah. Great example, right? Okay, I've been trying to think about uh, what, how I would answer this question. It's not fair for me to make you do it if I'm not going to do it. Uh, and uh, I can tell you this much, it's not golf. I like golf, but it's not golf that I'm good at. Um, so, uh, but one thing that has been, uh, that just struck me was that um, my daughter is seven, her name's Lucy, and she really wanted a Nintendo Switch for Christmas because a lot of kids in our neighborhood had a Nintendo Switch, but they're also kind of older than her, and a lot of games for that system are pitched developmentally probably above a seven-year-old. So instead, we got her the NES Classic, which has all the old games that we all love from the 80s. You just kind of plug it into the TV and go. And I discovered, or I rediscovered, that I'm actually really good at this. And I didn't remember that I was really good at that until I started playing it again. And uh, I, can tell, I can tell you from uh, that I remembered far more than I expected to. She loves this game now, so we have fun at night kind of uh, trying, to, uh, trying to get Mario where he needs to be. But there was a lot of failure along the way. And in fact, there are some really great books about how games, video games, board games, uh, are important tools for learning because of this. Uh, this element, the, the failing that has to happen before you can advance uh, to the next level. So I want you to keep all that in mind. This is kind of uh, the background of uh, thinking about how we can utilize failure as an opportunity to help our students learn more effectively. And it's drawn from the research that I've done for this book. Talk about a lot of things in that book. I know some I had a great conversation at lunch with folks who are reading it, uh, so uh, I won't really touch on any of these except to say that we're focusing on this one today. So it's by one of my uh, favorite writers, Ta-Nehisi Coates. I love this. I love this quote. Failure is probably the most important factor in all of my work. Writing is failure over and over and over again. And what is more true than that about writing? It is failing over and over and over again. Now, as you were all just talking about with kind of uh, both your classroom and your personal things that you're good at, we understand this about the learning process. As scholars and as faculty, as teachers, we understand that this is actually how learning happens. You try something out, you get it wrong, you get feedback, and you try it again. It's a natural cycle. We're built this way to learn from that cycle, but our educational systems in America are built in exactly the opposite way. So we understand that this is how learning happens, but more often than not, students are forced into a system where they have a small number of high stakes uh, opportunities to demonstrate their learning, and we arrest that process before it is allowed to play out, right? So we're gonna talk about some of those systemic issues as we go along. But we know that this is how learning works and our systems are built in exactly the opposite direction. And that's important for us as participants in higher education, but also as individual teachers in our own classrooms. Because this is how students experience failure. Big red letters screaming at them, as a personal judgment rather than a tool for helping them see how far they need to go and how much yet they need to learn and, and uh, some kind of feedback. Although grades and uh, the kind of the evaluative systems of education at some point at, or at some level are meant to indicate that to students, students do not see that. They do not experience failure as part of the learning process. They experience it as the end of a particular phase of the learning process for them. Right? So we're going to try and work on that. This is one of the, this is an amazing book. I, I, give, uh, I, I recommend this all the time, The Gift of Failure by Jessica Leahy. Uh, and she gets right to it here. We taught our kids to fear failure, and in so doing, we blocked the surest and clearest path to success. I won't read the whole thing, but I do want to highlight, we didn't mean to do it. We, we didn't intend to make them fear failure, and we did it for all well-intentioned reasons, but it's what we have wrought. Now, that's not just we as in the educational systems, that's we as in parents, that's a lot captured in that we, but she's right that part of the reason that we have such trouble building failure into the learning process is because of the messages that we send to children. 
I got this from the New York Times a year and a half ago now. Uh, the article this comes from was ostensibly about looking at maker spaces in elementary schools, but it opens this way. She gets there to observe uh, the, the, these elementary students at work, and she, she notices that they are unwilling to test things out. They're unwilling to try new things. And one of them says this, I can't do that. I'm not good at that. She remembered them saying, even at four or five years old, there was already a be perfect, don't fail attitude. Now that's kind of depressing, right? Um, so what I want you to do is to dive into this. I want you to talk to the, uh, the folks around you. What causes this? How do we get to this point where even at five years old, children are already afraid, uh, afraid to try something out and fail? Right? So talk to each other. I'm going to give you about five minutes. See what factors you can come up with that play into this mentality of fearing failure. What are some of the factors that contribute to children, even this young, fearing failure? What'd you come up with? One over here. Okay. Oh, I have a playground voice. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, my friend here and I discussed the fact that we tend to praise children a lot for performances, and so they get the notion that their job is to, as she said, show and tell, right. and, and we evaluate that. Okay, good. I'll take it back. All right, so one thing is the way we praise children, and we're going to talk a little bit about growth mindsets in a few minutes. Uh, and that comes from research by Carol Dweck at Stanford. And uh, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Fixed mindset, people believe that their intelligence uh, or their skill at, on any given thing, uh, they were granted at birth and there's no way to change it. Growth mindset, with hard work, we can improve, essentially. right? But one of the things, ways she says uh, to help cultivate a growth mindset uh, is uh, to praise differently, to praise on the effort and not the performance, right? You've worked really hard on that. I can see you worked hard on that. Look how, look what it led to, right? Um, now, there's a small caveat there that uh, folks who study inequities in education have talked about, and that is that there are some groups of children who never hear praise about anything at all. And so for those children, Praising performance is not a bad thing. It doesn't necessarily lead to fixed mindsets. It can actually do the opposite. So uh, really important. How we praise children can cultivate uh, an impression that all I have to do is do the thing, and that's good enough, right? All I have to do is show up. Good. OK, what else? What else leads to this? Over here and then over there. All right. Would you pass this over for me? Thank you. We discussed the fact that we rarely have them reflect on their failures and what they learn from it and how they can change things. Okay. So that growth mindset. All right, excellent. Right, so good. We don't often ask a small child when something has gone wrong, what can you learn from that, right? What do we, what do we know for next time you, know, you try and jump off the couch, that sort of thing, right? Uh, what, what, what have you learned from that? Uh, we don't often frame it that way. It's a, a kind of a strict punishment reward kind of framework. Good. My partner here was saying that uh, maybe the kids were told, you know, that's that's kind of complicated. You might break it, don't touch it, Good. or you might get hurt. Right. It, you know, and I saw that. Yeah, this was from makers, and so it's it's some sort of machine, probably that was being talked, you know, played with, mm -hmm. and. They've probably been cautioned so much. Don't touch. Right. Yes, absolutely. Very good point. So uh, sometimes children get the message, oh, don't, you know, that, that's too advanced for you. Don't play with that. It's too complicated. And that sends a very clear message. Don't, don't attempt to struggle. Don't attempt to try and figure it out. Um, and, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why they might get that message, but that is also an important one. In that book uh, that I was just talking about, The Gift of Failure, uh, Leahy's not talking about young kids. She's talking about more preteens. Um, and she gives the example of you know, trying to teach them how to do the laundry. 
uh, requires you to kind of release some of the control that you have over that process and be willing to see clothes get shrunk or whites turn pink, something like that, in order to actually teach them that it's not, it, it's not that they, they, it's not that it's too complicated. They need to get in there and figure it out, right? And there are all kinds of analogies and uh, are analogous situations to that. What else? Yes. Our group didn't discuss this one, but it just came to mind. I think sometimes we over reward or give okay, good. rewards for anything. And so as kids get older, I think they expect more or you have to kind of up the ante. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like they kind of <laughs> lose that right. intrinsic motivation to even try in the first place if there's not going to be any sort of personal benefit for them. Good. Good. Excellent. So this is an important one. Right now, a three-year-old likes stickers. Yes. But in the future, she might want a car. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Stickers turn to gold stars, turn to A's really quickly, right? Yes, definitely. So this is a really great point, uh, the, the culture of rewarding and, and how often we're, uh, children are rewarded and for what are they rewarded. It's not, that, uh, it's not to say that no rewards are what we're striving for here. It's what do we choose to reward? And there, uh, in, some, uh, you know, in some contexts, they're rewarded for doing very little. In other contexts, you know, I'm thinking of parenting contexts here where uh, in order, you know, the, our last line of defense to uh, get them to do something they're supposed to do is say, fine, just do it and I'll, give, I'll get you X, right? I'll get you some ice cream or whatever it is, right? Uh, and so there, there are lots of different ways where they get this message that it's the reward that we're trying for, not the learning, not the struggle, not the figuring things out. That's absolutely true. Good. Yes. Let me jump up there. Yeah. I just wanted to add on to that idea of reward because as we reward, then they might have a moral feeling that uh, now I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. So now I have succeeded and I've got a reward and now I'm good. So to feel good, like I'm right. instead of a bad person, I have to continue to get A's or build the correct blocks or perform so I can right. get that reward and feel better about who I am as a person. Good. Right, so we're refocusing some of those, um, so the, those values. So. That's absolutely right. So the rewards become internalized as messages about who they are as people, especially very early on in their lives. And so failing, and you can, you can probably see ripple effects of this in your own classrooms now. Failing at that early age becomes to them a judgment of who they are as people, and less about the process of learning, right? And that message takes hold very early and very deeply and has long-lasting effects. So that by the time they get to our classrooms, they've had many years of being conditioned into a mode of learning that stigmatizes failure. It says we have to avoid that. What we're really looking at, what we're really looking for is the reward. Give me the reward, give me the A, and I'll go on my merry way. Don't make me struggle because that means I'm bad and that's a message I've got for a long time. Okay. Good. Uh, one last thing. Uh, sometimes letting them struggle, I, this is just uh, you know, being very honest, like, let's take seatbelts in the car. Sometimes having them struggle for five minutes trying to learn how to get the seat, we just don't have time for it. So we do what's easier for us and we, what we do is we help them skip. Uh, that really important step. And again, as Jessica Leahy said, we're not doing it because we're mean-spirited. We're not even intending to send these messages. It just happens to be the messages that we're sending them at, you know, at, at both home and at school. And as college teachers, as instructors, the ripple effects that we then see in our classroom when they're 18 and beyond are pretty profound. Good. All right, so here's what we're going to look at today. Uh, we're going to talk about why we make so many mistakes all the time. And we're going to look at some factors as to why college students might experience failure. And then the most important thing, and, and the, the, the hard work that we'll do today, uh, creating opportunities for people to learn from failure, to reorient failure as something to be avoided to a learning opportunity. Right? But first, 
Why do we make some mistakes? Uh, the, <laughs> there's good news and bad news. The bad news is we are making mistakes all the time. All the time, constantly we're making mistakes. Uh, and it, this is uh, another really happily titled book here, uh, Being Wrong. Uh, and it's all about the many ways every day that we're wrong. And part of why we're wrong is because our brain uses shortcuts to make decisions all the time. And sometimes those shortcuts she's talking about here and other people call heuristics, some people, uh, sometimes those shortcuts lead us to correct answers, but more often than not, they lead us to incorrect answers. So one of the things she's talking about here is probability versus possibility. Our brains make snap decisions based on probability, not possibility. And because of that, sometimes it's right, but many times it's not right. And we use little shortcuts like that all the time. Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel for economics and wrote a book, Thinking Fast and Slow, the whole book is about these shortcuts called heuristics. And the one he harps on the most, and it's absolutely true, and we're all guilty of it in this room, is the causation heuristic. We are very good at seeing event A followed by event B and assuming that A caused B. We make that leap right away without any thought, rational thought behind it. There's just a shortcut that sometimes works for our brain. And our brains are nothing if not pragmatic, right? They want, uh, they want answers fast and they want, uh, they want uh, the knowledge that they need in order to, to you know, survive. So they're making quick decisions all the time. So we are making lots of mistakes. That's the bad news. The good news is that we are built to not only detect, to make those mistakes, but to detect them and to learn from them. So the good news here is that that is a feature and not a bug of how we learn. Yes, we're making mistakes all the time, but our brains are built to detect those. These, uh, the, these series of letters up here refer to two signal processors in our brains. ERN stands for error-related negativity, and PE stands for error positivity. And they both do very similar things. They're detect they're they're assessing stimuli, all the stimuli that go by, basically right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. And when they hit something wrong, an alarm goes off, and it's the signal to draw cognitive resources to the error that has been made. So they detect the error, and then the other parts of our brain kick into gear to figure out what happened, what went wrong, how do we figure it out, how do we learn from it, right? So all of this is happening all the time. We make the error, but then we learn from it, and that mirrors that learning cycle we were talking about earlier. I don't know this, uh, this, uh, this baby, but uh, uh, the reason he or she is up here uh, is because the way that this has been studied in the, in the real world, the way uh, failure and learning from it has been studied, at least the early days of it, has been developmental psychologists studying how babies learn from failed expectations. And this goes all the way back to one of the, uh, one of the most famous uh, psychologists in the 20th century, Jean Piaget. He's been replicated over and over again. <clears throat> Piaget, by the way, studied his own kids. It's a whole conflict of interest conversation that we don't have time to get into. But one of the things that he did study was what's called expectancy failure. And he came up with an experiment that's been replicated over and over and over again to the same results. And what he did was he would hide a baby's toy under a blanket, had two blankets, hide it under one blanket, show the baby the, the toy, put it under the blanket, ask the baby where the toy was. They, they reveal it, right? They pull up the blanket. On the 11th time, takes the toy, shows the baby the toy, and puts it under blanket B, says, where's the toy? Without fail, every time, the baby looks under the first blanket, right? Expectancy failure. That's where the baby expects the toy to be, and it's not there. Shows where the toy actually is, and over a series of instances of doing that, the baby will eventually figure out that the toy is going to be under blanket B, but it takes time, because we are built to base our decisions on what has happened rather than what might happen, and so the baby will always look under the first blanket, and he has to learn to look under the second blanket. Now, there are all kinds of varieties on that experiment, all kinds of different ways that developmental psychologists have looked at uh, similar features 
of the learning process, but it all boils down to one thing. We make mistakes and we know how to learn from them. It is a natural process. It's built into who we are biologically. It is a cycle that we have to really go through in order to effectively learn uh, anything. And uh, these babies have taught us a lot about that process. What happens when we get to college students? Why, what are some reasons that they might encounter failure in our courses? Well, I want, what I want to talk about first are those reasons that have nothing at all to do with what we are teaching them, right? Students are human beings who bring with them their entire lives into our classroom. And some of that, even though we wish it might not be the case, some of that has an impact on what they're able to learn in our courses. So many of you have seen this before, uh, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I recently heard that he, uh, he plagiarized this from a Native American model. I, I don't know the truth of that, but I started to look into it. Uh, it's a little upsetting having used Maslow over and over again, uh, but uh, be aware that uh, it may not be all it's cracked up to be. The, the basic model, though, speaks to a truth about how outside factors will influence the learning process. So essentially, the basic needs must be met. These are basic human needs that must be met before anything else is possible. So in other words, if a student is wondering where her next meal might come from or where he's going to sleep at night, it is very difficult for them to learn calculus or history or chemistry or anything else we might try to teach. The basic needs take over. That's really important to know. Some of the safety needs also, right? If you're feeling unsafe, if you're feeling anxious, these are emotional components as well. There's been some amazing work on the effect of anxiety on our learning processes, the effect of fear on curiosity, things like that. When we are afraid, our brains shut down. I right? know lots of good reasons for why that might be, but that's a, that's a safety need. Um, also, uh, one important safety need ties into the psychological component there, and it's uh, absolutely on target for what we're talking about today. Fe uh, fear of failure will inhibit the learning process. And this is true. There have been studies to show that is true even for students who have not experienced very much failure themselves. That if they fear failure, and this is a very common fear, the percentages are uh, astronomical uh, in college students, that fearing failure will inhibit the learning process. So these are all things that have nothing to do. I teach medieval literature. These have nothing to do with medieval literature, except maybe some people might be afraid of dragons. I don't know. But uh, uh, largely, nothing to do with the content of my course. But they're having a significant impact on how those students can learn. So what do we do as faculty? Well, uh, you know, sometimes these things will be happening, and we won't have any idea that they're happening. We may see the struggle but we won't know why. It's important to have this as context so that we know what to do if we do know what's going on with that student. Uh, otherwise, though, you know, we're not clinical psychologists, unless you have a PhD in clinical psychology, but it's really not up to us to solve these problems, right? In fact, we could damage the student far more if we attempt to do that uh, than if we do what we're supposed to do, which is get them to the right resources on campus that can help. Right? But this is important to know. Then there are the factors that have to do with what we are actually teaching in the classroom. There are many. I have three of the most common reasons a student might experience struggle or failure in the classroom. You know, we could talk about these for hours. But uh, first of all, incorrect or incomplete prior knowledge. When a student comes to our classrooms with prior knowledge that is on target and solid, our job is very easy. But unfortunately, that is most often not the case. They either have incorrect or incomplete models that they're bringing in with us. Now, these are, this is a very difficult element of teaching to change because you can't just change a student's prior knowledge or a prior model by simply telling him or her that it is incorrect. No amount of you slamming your hand on the board and saying, this is wrong is actually going to change that model, right? 
In order to change a student's prior knowledge, they have to be confronted with the failure of that model. So we need, that means for us, designing assignments and activities where in the process of that, they are going to run up against the failure of their prior knowledge, right? Now, uh, sometimes that's easier than others. <clears throat> if the prior knowledge is connected to an element of who they are as people, some sort of psychological element, some sort of emotional component, it's a lot harder to change. And in fact, we might never succeed in changing it if it's at that level. Uh, but it's important to know that we cannot just tell someone it's wrong because a human being will always find ways to adapt new information to a previous model, right? We are very, very bad at creating whole new models for ourselves. So you gotta think about that as uh, a reason students might struggle. It's a very powerful reason. So one strategy that I know lots of folks use in many different forms, some sort of activity at the beginning of the semester to figure out what it is that they are bringing with them to your class. Now, it can, uh, I know a lot of folks who do a basic pre-post kind of test, right? Here are questions. Uh, that I want to know uh, your answers to before the semester even starts, so I know how to teach you. I know what you're bringing with you to this course. Others do it through discussion or, or, or take-home assessments, something like that. But you have to know what it is that they are bringing with them to your course in order to really teach effectively and kind of head off some of these uh, struggles and failures, uh, or, or at least be able to better utilize them. Cognitive load, I know uh, a, a friend of mine says that cognitive load is the teaching problem that we need to really wrestle with. Cognitive load is very simply how much can we hold in our minds at one time before we can't figure it out anymore, can't hold anymore in there. A couple of different kinds. Intrinsic cognitive load is the, the type of load that is connected to the material at hand. This is most often a problem for students in introductory level classes where they have no background in the assignment. They're trying to build all of these new connections. They have so much information that's being shoved into their brains that at some point they just can't hold anymore. And that's where you start to see the failure and the struggle happen. Extraneous, that's the stuff that doesn't have to do with what you're teaching. It could be technological distractions uh, in the classroom. It could be just daydreaming, but it's cognitive load that's shoving out important information and kind of taking over the space necessary for learning, right? And so scaffolding, any time that we can scaffold the work that we're doing, it helps to alleviate some of that cognitive load. How we structure our exams and other assessments can really help with that as well. And finally, transfer. Transfer is another key learning problem that ties into how students might struggle in our courses. We have all seen this as educators. We know students learn something in a particular context, but they seem unable to transfer it to another context, even though you know they learned it because the colleague who taught them that is at the office next door. You've talked to them about it, right? They, they know this information, but what they don't know is how to apply it into a different context. We are very poor as people at what's called task switching. And so information that we learn our brains are coding it to the particular context that we learned it in. So you might learn about photosynthesis in your intro bio class, but then when you're taking botany, it may not occur to you you've ever heard of photosynthesis before because you're coding that to the particular context, the room, the situation, the time of day that you learned it in the first time. And so we need to be really transparent with students to build those bridges. Okay? This is photosynthesis. You learned about this in intro bio. Let me give you a quick overview of the, uh, of the core uh, parts of this, uh, and let's then apply it to the work we're doing in botany, for example, right? We need, to, we need to build those bridges. These are very common ways, though, that we will see uh, students struggle, and there are things that we can do to help them uh, through that struggle and to utilize that struggle. All right, now we're getting to the fun stuff. I'm going to have you doing some work in just a little bit. 
So if we know all this about, about learning, that learning requires uh, trying something out, failing, getting feedback, trying again. If we know we're built to make mistakes and to learn from them, if we know uh, that, our, our, that there are key points in our courses where students might struggle, then part of the solution is design pedagogies that utilize failure as a learning opportunity. Right? All kinds of ways that we can do this, everything from uh, having more low stakes or no stakes assignments, redistributing our course grade, we can talk all about some of this stuff later, but there are two things that we have to keep in mind if we're going to do this successfully. The first thing, we need to actually prepare our students how to learn from failure. Because if you just walk in one day and say, okay class, we're gonna do a lot of failing today and it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be a revolution. They're gonna run for the door because they've never heard that before and they've never experienced that before. So we need to prepare them. We need to teach them how to do it. Now I have some models up here these are not endorsements, and I'm going to talk about why in a second, but these are ways that people have tried to address the notion of how to prepare someone to take failure as an opportunity rather than a judgment, right? So uh, we talked a little bit about Dweck, uh, so I won't talk anymore about her. Grit has been in the news a lot. Uh, Duckworth's book came out about it uh, about two years ago, I guess, uh, but she's been working on it a lot more or for a lot longer than that. Um, grit is essentially <clears throat> passion times perseverance. She has a complicated equation for how it all works, right? Uh, it's, it, what it means, though, is not giving up, right? Not, uh, not, uh, not stopping when you could push through and find the answer. Um, now, what I want to say about both of those, and here's why these are not endorsements. I'm a big believer in uh, approaching educational research as the beginning of a conversation and not the ending of a conversation. And so I think it's probably best to take what feels right and what we know works about those models and uh, think about taking the best of those approaches and combining them in our work in the classroom. Here's why I say that. Both of those have come under a lot of fire from more recent research for the claims that they have made and whether or not they're actually effective. So there's a meta-analysis two years ago and one very recently about mindsets. Uh, and it, it, what that newer work said was that there really isn't, according to them, a correlation between having a growth mindset and doing better in your coursework. What they showed was that there was a correlation between having a growth mindset and more motivation to learn. Now, to me, that's a good thing. It's not what Dweck originally wanted, but that's, that's good for me to know. That's, I would love for my students to be more motivated to learn, and if helping them cultivate a growth mindset gets them to that point, I'm okay with it, right? So taking the best of what we know about these models. The same is true with grit. Uh, Duckworth, uh, in addition to her model, her original claim was that your level of grit was predictive of your success. And so she had this little grit scale thing, uh, and the higher that you scored on that, the better you were supposed to do. Uh, and that has been completely unpacked by recent research showing uh, that it's really not predictive. Does that mean that we should throw it out entirely? I don't think so. Uh, in fact, I was never sold on the prediction stuff anyway. What I want to know how do I help students persevere? How do, I help, how do I help them keep pushing when they might otherwise stop? And so what I look to, what I'm really drawn to by Duckworth, uh, is the story she tells at the beginning of her book, which is that when she was, uh, her whole idea for this model came when she was an eighth grade math teacher, and she saw a student stop working on the problem, and she could identify that if he had just worked five minutes more, he would have got it, right? And so it was her actual experience in a classroom that led her to believe that there are things that we can do as teachers to help students keep pushing through, right? How do you prep someone to learn from failure? You have to figure out how to push past those failures, right? Uh, I love this one, Anandaya Kundu, his book on agency is coming out next year. Um, what he said is, yeah, these are okay, and Duckworth was actually on his dissertation committee, so he was brave in saying this. Uh, these are okay, but what they ignore are the social inequities that might help someone have uh, one student 
cultivated growth mindset much easier than another student. And so he attends to some of those systemic problems that I think we really need to pay attention to, some of these. So uh, we, can, we can say learn from failure all you want, but if we don't address those problems, we're not gonna get very far. And one last one that I also really like uh, and recommend often, uh, the discussing struggles. This comes from a paper by Lynn Sigler. She divided her students into two groups. One group's learned about basic science principles through only through stories about the success of the scientists that made those discoveries. And the other group learned about them only through the lens of the stories of the failures of those scientists that led to those discoveries. And it was that group that did better on the final assessments. Because what she's doing there, and we can do this in our own classes, she's destigmatizing failure by saying, look, even these famous people who you've all heard of struggled along the way. They made lots of attempts, lots of failure before they got to the right answer. As you know, we can do that as well. We can also just be really honest about places that we've struggled, right? Here are concepts that it took me a while to get when I was learning this for the first time. It's not something that magically happens for us. It's a process. And the more they see that, uh, the, the, the more acculturated they are to learning from those opportunities. Yeah. Why is it, I was just thinking as you were talking about that, about demonstrating it in your class, in sports or in music or in drama or wherever, students see each other struggle. They yes. see each other lose the fail of their minds or lose the point and have to practice over and over. But in academics, we've grown a culture here in the US and Canada to hide our academic performance. The FERPA, the hiding the grades. We, we learn that it is not good for students to ever show failure in front of other students or even right. teachers. It's supposed to be kind of a secret thing that we disguise. So turning that culture around to say it's actually okay to struggle and fail in front of your peers right. is a big cultural change. It is. And this is why we have to do a lot of the work up front to dismantle some of that baggage that's being brought to it. And as, as lone individuals, we are not going to fully succeed in this. These are just steps that we can take. Now, you brought up theater, but I do think that it, faculty in the arts have known this for a long time and have been working on this. My wife is an art professor, and they, uh, you know, their entire system operates on a critique model, where you see a piece, you offer sometimes formative feedback and other times some uh, less constructive feedback. And you're supposed to learn from that and grow from that. And it's all socialized uh, expressions of, of trying and failing, right? Uh, and so I, I do think that uh, there, there's a lot that we can look to uh, to our faculty in the arts to learn some of these things as well. All right, after this, though, second, and this is, uh, this is where we get to what can we actually do, another important thing, assessing the error climate of our courses and designing opportunities for failure. Error climate, I designed this a couple of years ago when I was at Rice, is freely available at this link. It is an error climate inventory. It's drawn from research to show that, uh, that helping students learn from failure depends absolutely on the climate of our course for how we talk about failure, how we treat mistakes ourselves, how we embrace not knowing something, the assignments that we create, so it's multifaceted. How are we communicating what we uh, believe about error and mistakes? How are we helping them to see it and then to learn from that? Because for example, we could preach the good word of learning from failure all we want, but if we ourselves uh, criticize or punish ourselves in front of students for not getting something right or not knowing something, we are sending them a message that runs entirely counter to the climate that we're trying to construct. And so, you know, moving from that kind of environment to, you know, I really don't know that, but here's how we might try and find it, right? Uh, so that's just one example. But uh, you can go to this, you can take the inventory, it just give, it's not a validated instrument, but it does give you kind of a, a temperature check on your, own, on your own courses in terms of error climate. So we have to do that before any of these other strategies will be successful. When we run through some of these, we're gonna talk about how you might uh, think about them in your own courses. So one uh, very basic way uh, that people have been experimenting with for a very long time, finding and explaining errors and misconceptions. Now these can be in-class activities, they can be exam questions. I know a lot of folks who are 
doing something like this for exam questions. Instead of trying to find the right answer, you're explaining why answers are incorrect. And in doing that, you're learning a heck of a lot about the concepts that you're talking about. So here's some basic, I mean that algebra equation, that's just basic. You're identifying, that's the wrong answer, here's why it's wrong, right? This is a little bit more conceptual. A common Psych 101 mistake, students, students get positive reinforcement pretty easily, right? Uh, one thing that, that Psych faculty often tell me though is that introductory level students have a really hard time understanding the concept of negative reinforcement. Their immediate prior knowledge that they're bringing to that, the model is, they assume that negative reinforcement means punishment, right? That you get spanked when you do something wrong, you get yelled at when you do something wrong, the, you know, the whole class gets, has to stay in for recess because someone did something wrong. However, negative reinforcement uh, is the opposite of positive reinforcement. You're removing something in order to reinforce a particular behavior. It has nothing to do with punishment. But the students in Psych 101 struggle with that. They have a really hard time with that. So having this up here on the screen, uh, which is the wrong answer, and having them work through that in class, in teams, or on an exam, uh, helps them to uh, not only learn the concept better, but figure out that wrong answers teach us just as much, if not more, than correct answers. Good. So again, you can do that in any kind of setting. If you're teaching 150 students, you can still do this by uh, you know, throwing the question up on the screen using Poll Everywhere or any other kind of free uh, kind of polling device, right? The process is still the same. You're just scaling it to more students. Here's another one. Uh, this comes from work by the Bjorks on desirable difficulties. Called that because these are strategies that make learning very difficult at first, but make it easier to pull out later on, right? Makes it difficult to remember at first, but then when you need it, it's easier to apply it. So I have a couple here, the red are the wrong activity, uh, the, the green are their suggestions. Our students typically study using a block studying method. And that means, well, first of all, it means that they're cramming, right? Right before an exam, and we all know how our memories work with cramming. Cramming means that you're shoving information into your working memory just long enough to be able to utilize it. It never makes it to long-term storage. It gets dumped after you use it, right? That's what cramming is. Uh, block studying is one type of that, where students will, will try and memorize all of topic A and then move on to all of topic B and just proceed that way in studying. Uh, and some have some success with that. I mean, you can't deny that. But a more effective way to study is interleaving, which is harder at first, but leads to deeper learning and, and better access in the memory. So interleaving is instead of studying all of A, then all of B, then all of C, you mix it up. A little of A, a little B, a little C, a little D. And I'll, I'll tell you about one of their classic experiments that had to do with art history. So they had one group of students that were learning about uh, famous painters and their paintings through the block studying method. So they would study 10 Van Goghs, try and memorize all those. Then they would study 10 Da Vinci's, etc. right? The interleaving group would study one Van Gogh, one Da Vinci, one Monet, one Manet, and then go back and try it again. At the end of about an hour, they were given a quiz. On that quiz, the block studiers got an 80%, the interleavers got a 60%. They came back a week later, took the same quiz, the block studiers got a 20%, the interleavers held steady at 60%. So we can argue about how good is the 60%, but I think the value there is that it didn't change. They were able to pull it back when they needed it. And it's hard, desirable difficulty, because it's hard to do that. It's hard at first, which is why they didn't do as well on the first quiz, but it leads to deeper learning over time. Another one here that folks have had a lot of success with, choosing answers versus generating answers, that students who are given study materials that are multiple choice will learn less than if they have to generate the answers themselves, even if they don't know the answer at first and have to really struggle to find the answer. Because uh, you may have had this experience yourself. If you're trying to study something and you're given options, 
you can kind of say, ah, it's probably that one, right? And move on to the next one, something that feels right, and then you look at the answer and say, oh, I didn't get that right, I guess I know what it is. You don't really, it's just looking familiar. You're not encoding anything into your memory. Generating answers, though, is, the, uh, is a twist on that same formula. You get the question, but there are no choices. You are forced to kind of generate the answer to the question. Even if you don't know it at first, it encodes it more deeply in your memory. Now as instructors, we can utilize these strategies. We can teach students how to do these. We can actually model it in the work uh, of a daily class session. We can build assignments that ask them to do these things, right? So we can utilize these strategies for uh, learning from failure in our own courses. Okay, this is one where I'm gonna ask you to do some work. This is my favorite one, and I could talk about this for a long time, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna introduce it, and then you're gonna do some of it. This is Productive Failure. It's a strategy uh, developed by Manu Kapoor. He's been working on it for about 10 years. His strategy is to teach students a particular concept. Now, he is a, he's dealt mainly with physics and math, problem-based disciplines. So his strategy, he's going to teach students a concept, a particular core concept, and assess that they know it day one. Day two, they come in, and they spend the first 10 to 15 minutes answering a problem that he has constructed that draws on the prior knowledge of the concept he taught them, but he knows that they can't answer because it's ultimately about a concept they haven't learned yet. Then, after the 15 minutes, he debriefs them. You know, that he asks several different folks for their approaches to the answers. Then he gives the, the correct answer. And the idea here is that each student takes from that debriefing the exact piece of information that he or she needed in order to solve that equation, but didn't have because it was relying on the failing of the knowledge. I'm going to give you an example. Here I was learning a lot myself. I hear force is an important concept in physics, right? <laughs> One of the basic Newtonian laws. So force is mass times acceleration. If we were looking at Kapoor's model, what he would do is he would make sure his students knew this concept and he had assessed that they fully understood this concept. Not just the equation, but the concept. And then he would bring them in the next day and ask them something like this place a box of incredible books of teaching and learning, which I'm sure you all have on your desk. So you can read them over the summer, mass of 25 pounds, box of six square feet. The question is, how much pressure does the box exert on the top of the desk? Now, ostensibly, it has nothing to do with anything they've learned. And he is relying on the fact that they will not know how to solve the problem. His goal is to have them tap back into what they learned about force, so they get this problem and they say, all right, this must have something to do with force. How can I take what I learn and just sketch out an outline of a potential answer or take a stab at what an equation might look like? He knows that they will fail. They know that they will fail, but they're trying to figure out what would I do? What could I do to answer this question? Right? They all sketch out their answers over 10 or 15 minutes. He asked them, uh, asked for various volunteers to talk about their solution, and then he debriefs. And eventually what he's trying to get them to is the fact that the equation for pressure relies on understanding force. So he's tapping into their idea of force in order to give them eventually the information that they need to learn about pressure. Productive failure, because they will fail. They will not get this answer, but they will be able to pull out what they need from the debriefing to have answered that question. Now, the reason this is so powerful and he's getting amazing results with this is because essentially what he has done is to figure out how to scale individualized instruction to any number of students. That's the great teaching question, right? How do you, how do you capture what is important and powerful about a one-on-one -on -one teaching and learning situation and scale it out to 100 students? This is a strategy that comes close to doing that because students are recognizing what they individually need. Okay? Again, it's kind of problem-based, but I'm gonna have you do this. We're gonna do productive failure with Old English right now. So I'm the instructor, 
And I had to assess that you learn these three things. So first thing, <clears throat> that funny looking that funny looking P there, that's called a thorn, and it makes the TH sound in modern English. Everyone good with that? Thorn is TH. Number two, the thing that looks like an A and E smashed together, that's called an ash, and it uh, produces the A ah sound in cat. That's number two. Are we okay with that? I got to assess. Are we okay? All right, good. Uh, and number three, some Old English words resemble their modern English equivalents, especially helping verbs and prepositions. Right? Some resemble their modern English equivalents, especially words like helping verbs and prepositions. Now, if you look at the history of languages, that's true of a lot of the evolution of language. The words that are used the most retain their, their form and function over time. So, important that they resemble some of their modern English equivalents. So I've just taught you this, and I've assessed that you know this, and now I'm asking you to translate this line from Beowulf. On your own, no talking to anyone, that was good tuning. I'm going to give you two minutes to write down your translation to that based on having learned those three concepts. All right, we're going to go through this. By the way, I have Old English slash Anglo-Saxon. We don't call it Anglo-Saxon anymore. Anyone here know Christine Cooper Rampado in English? She, went to, I, she and I went to grad school together. She can tell you all about why we don't use that anymore. Uh, brilliant teacher. I have so much respect for her. Um, Good, so that was go Kuning. Here's a translation. That was a good king. Now, how many of you had that, that as that? All right. Many, many, many people because some Old English words resemble their modern English equivalents, especially uh, the functional ones. How many of you had was as was? Okay, roughly the same number, but fewer. Right, and that, because that's a little bit uh, trickier. How many had gold is good? Ooh, that's good. That might be the most ever of any, any time I've done this, right? Now, those of you who didn't have your hand up, uh, you might have had God. Anyone who didn't have their hand up have God in there? Okay, good. Uh, and what's interesting about that is the, the word for God in Old English is the same as good. So that is actually the word. For God, but not in this context. Um, now, how many had Kuning as king? Many. Oh, you did? There we go. So <laughs> there you go. Excellent. Well, and of course, English is a Germanic language, right? And so there's a there's a, a lesson there. So he drew on his prior knowledge of a different language to get that word. But there were uh, many fewer hands up, understandably because this word doesn't fit any of the concepts that you learn, that's where the failure comes in. So now you all know, individually, which pieces of this puzzle you needed in order to translate that line effectively, right? I could have stood up here and translated it for you, but that would not have had put you through the process of encountering the failure of your knowledge and learning which piece you needed in order to translate that. You had your hand up? Um, well, I pay, I pay attention to what you said about adverbs and adjectives, so I didn't get this correct. I, I, I thought that was a good singing. Oh, right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, relating to the importance of adverbs and adjectives. And Excellent. Relying on previous languages. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah, so we, we're always drawing on that prior knowledge. This is a great, uh, a great way, especially if you're in a problem-based discipline, uh, to help our students learn from actual, in, actually encountering the failure of their knowledge. Now, it's less clear, although I think it's possible, how we import this strategy into the humanities and the social sciences, right? I actually emailed Manu Kapoor and asked him as I was writing this book, how do you do this? Do you have any ideas for humanities and social sciences? And he never responded. So. Uh, which is dangerous because that left me to my own devices uh, to come up with ideas. And I do think it's possible. I think if you teach psychology or sociology, that uh, teaching about a particular concept one day and then students coming in and looking at a data set the next day that they've never seen before, but you're asking them to interpret that data, 
uh, they have to tap into the, the knowledge or the concept that you taught them. I think it's a similar thing. It, it really can uh, be utilized in other disciplines. I think the same thing in the humanities. We teach something conceptual, like feminist reading of texts, and then they come in the next day and you give them a poem they've never seen before. Can, these are things that can be imported with slight modifications. Good. I'm going to get to the elephant in the room, which is grades, right? Uh, we have to, if we're going to talk about learning from failure, we have to talk about grades because we are functioning within systems that no matter what we do as individuals, we still have to give grades at the end of a semester, right? And so we have to think about how those two things are in conflict and how we can reconcile that conflict. So what I have up here um, is uh, one of the most well-known papers in the literature on grades, and I love it because it was a total surprise to the, uh, to the investigators what they found. Uh, so they, they put their students in three conditions, and one condition, uh, students only got a grade, in one they only got feedback, and in one they got both a grade and a feedback. Now, which of those groups do you think the investigators hypothesized would be more motivated to learn? Heard just feedback? What else? What were you saying? Both. Both. Okay, yes. That is, in fact, what they hypothesized that students who got both a grade and feedback would be more motivated to learn. What they found was that the students who only got feedback were the ones who were more motivated to learn. Now, for a couple of reasons. One is you have all experienced this. When you give a grade plus feedback, what do students do? They look at the grade and they shut the paper and that's the end of the story, right? So one thing is they are drawn to the evaluative mark that we're given and we could spend hours writing feedback and they're, they're not processing it in the same way. The other thing is, uh, the other reason for that is we have placed them in situations where we have essentially trained them that the grade is the only thing that matters. The feedback doesn't register for them at the same level. Uh, as the grade does. But if you give them a paper with only feedback, number one, there's nothing else for them to focus on. And number two, you send a message instead, this is what learning is all about, the feedback. And that is, in fact, the, uh, if you walk away with nothing else from this workshop, one of the biggest premises from the science of learning that I found in doing research is that we learn from feedback, not evaluation. This has been true of human beings for as long as we've been around, right? People learning to walk are not given grades on that process, right? The first uh, people who were building fire were not told that's a B minus fire, right? This is not the way we learn. We learn from feedback on the learning process. And so that is one of the things that this paper uh, really reinforces for us. I love it because they, they were truly surprised by that finding. Uh, and it reinforces for us the fact that we are in systems where students experience failure and learning like this. Big red marks, right? Uh, the, the project I'm working on now is really immersed in the research on grades. And if I'm being honest with you, none of it is positive. None of it is good. We could pick any topic uh, having to do with grades. They're shown to impede learning, to impede motivation, to lead to more cheating in classes, to have a major effect on students' mental health to reproduce the inequities of society in our own classrooms. I mean, none of it is positive. And yet we're in systems where we have to give the grades. And so we need to reconcile this. So there's, there are lots of faculty, and I was talking to a group at lunch about this and, and even a little bit before that. There's, there's a lot of, uh, of folks right now who are experimenting with more progressive grading models. There are lots of them out there contract grading, specifications grading, standards-based grading, mastery grading, ungrading, all the way on the other end of the system, which is no grades at all over the course of the semester. The final grade is determined by a conference between uh, faculty and students. Right? Now, that, that might not sound like your cup of tea, uh, but there are lots of other models that you could potentially try to heighten the value of feedback and to actually match our grading system with our values for student learning, right? If a value that we hold based in this research is that students learn best when they can try things out in the safe environment, 
uh, and get feedback and to learn from that, then our grading systems that we use have to align with that particular value. So it's something to think about. It's not an easy answer. And we could talk all about the intricacies of some of those other models, but it is a reality. And I personally think that uh, the new research that I was just talking about that's coming out showing the causal links between academic stress due to grades and the rise in mental health issues with preteens and teenagers, that brings it from an academic subject to a moral imperative for colleges to wrestle with, right? If we know that information and we choose not to do anything about it, that's on us. And I think that that's a serious issue that we really need to uh, confront as educators, right? Okay, good. So I want to, uh, some last bits of work that I want you to, to think about and then we can talk about. I want you to think about where can you include some opportunities for failure, either of course you're teaching this semester or next semester. And then also how might you utilize some pedagogies of failure. So I'm gonna give you 10 minutes to think about this, sketch out some ideas, talk to each other, then we'll come back as a group and talk about them a little bit more. Right. So based on what you heard today, where can you include some of these opportunities in your courses? That's a course design question. And how might you utilize some of those pedagogies in your classroom? That's a teaching strategy question. Uh, this first question is more of a course design question. At the level of course design, how can we think about including some opportunities for failure? So what did you come up with? What are some of the, the ways to do this? Opportunities for failure. Here. I think for me one of the things I just recognize with that question is I can do a better job framing at the beginning okay. that we're going to push up against the limits of their prior knowledge on purpose and that there's a reason why we're going to do these things. So that's not a specific answer to your question, but it's a, I think I need to do that piece better so that I can do the next step, which is actually the activity. Okay, now that's a great suggestion, and uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, no matter what you're trying in the classroom, tra more transparency is always better with students, right? Uh, it, it, you know, beyond failure, any kind of new teaching strategy, talking to students about why. But I love the way you framed it, pushing up against the boundaries of their prior knowledge and, ex and explaining why, what the reason for why they're doing that. And I think that that's absolutely crucial to getting them on board and buying into uh, the fact that uh, they're going to enter kind of a scary place of, of not knowing and, and how you're going to help them with that. I think that's great. Others? In here and then one over there. Um, so I teach in aviation, so I think it takes a little, little extra effort to create a Kobayashi Maru. Um, <laughs> I know. Um, but you, you create a scenario that you know they have to think outside the box. Right. Um, you know, in aviation, obviously, I'm not going to do that in the airplane. And so we do that in our simulators. And over the last 50 years, aviation simulation has become so refined that you can do things like fail an engine, electrical problems, hydraulic problems, insidious things that they may not catch as a crew. Right. And you know, in an airplane, I'm going to take the airplane before they go too far. But in the simulator, I can allow them to go to that extent. So, so I haven't created these scenarios, but we've created some here for our students of how can they develop from single pilot, single engine, small airplanes to much more complicated scenarios. Um, to be able to see that you know, when, when they, the first time they, they don't catch that fuel leak when they're doing a cross-country mission the sim, and all of a sudden they get in close, hey, we're out of fuel, we're over the mountains, there's no place to land, when they realize that they're going to crash, it, it's, it's very realistic for them when you're in the full motion simulator. Sure. Um, so it's a much different experience. Right, exactly. And I think, um, it, first of all, it's a safe place to fail, but uh, you can imagine when the emotions are heightened in that kind of environment, the learning that you can get from those moments of failure is even more dramatic, right? And uh, we were just talking a few minutes ago, there's been some great work showing how simulations can really uh, help enhance what students can learn from failure. Nursing schools are using a lot of simulations, and there was a really great study recently on uh, surgeons in training, uh, and what they were studying, they were studying surgeons who only practiced in simulations and those who only practiced on cadavers. Uh, and they found that the, the, the number of mistakes made uh, between the two were roughly similar 
And in fact, the, the, those in the simulation condition often had fewer mistakes because they were allowed to fail uh, in, uh, in, in really, um, really visible ways and to learn from that failure, right? So they were nicking the artery in the simulation and clearly, in a very similar, you know, analogous circumstance, nicking the artery in the simulator and learning right away what happens right, when you do that. And so, uh, obviously, you can't do that on live patients, right? Uh, and, and so, yeah. Cut you off. I'll give it back to you. <laughs> when you're in that moment and you're say you're working one-on-one -on -one or you're in a small group with students where you can address it directly and there has been some kind of a big failure, we can recognize there's been a failure. Mm -hmm. we do, or students are presenting and you can pause the presentation and say, is there some research that shows the best way to address that failure? Is it with compassion? Is it with a direct response? I mean, I'm just wondering right. if you've come across something where you're like, that's the way... <laughs> to address that. Yeah, that's a tricky yeah. one. Right, that's a tricky I haven't seen anything specifically addressing that. Um, the, the stuff around it, though, um, empathy is always better, right? Um, so handling it in a way that uh, calls attention to it but doesn't alienate or embarrass the student. But that's the fine line. How do you do that, right? Um, and I, so part of it... Um, you know, I think there are a number of things that you could do there. Part of the project or the presentation could be identifying uh, identifying errors and talking through what would they do differently, right? And that would maybe allow you as an instructor to say, well, let's go to the slide, you know, 15. Do you see anything up there that you might do differently and kind of have them walk through it? So building a reflection component or an error identifying component into it could help. Uh, there's another way on the back end to kind of in... Um, reflecting on the different uh, on the different projects that that students are seeing they can talk about it in their reflection to you and then you can kind of address it more globally uh, as a class and then talk to the student individually if that makes sense um, so there are a couple of different ways right we're always trying trying to balance the learning opportunity with uh, uh, the not alienating a particular student so that's a, that's a really great question good yes um, so I, uh, during your presentation, actually, you helped me solve a problem I was having because um, my my lab. So I teach physiology to first year veterinary students, and mm. I usually give them a clinical case halfway through the course. And nice. my lab got rescheduled from a Wednesday to a Monday, which is uh, you know when it got rescheduled, I didn't think it was a big deal. And then I was, as I was planning the lab activity for next week, I noticed that they wouldn't have some fundamental knowledge to go to work through that case. Oh, but I can give that case and have them fail a little bit and maybe leave that assignment open until later in the course so they can go back and work on it. Continue. That's a great idea. So no, reframing any it. Suggestions? Any anything else I should do? No, I, I like that a lot. So reframing it as a productive failure exercise, yes. where and they not something like, oh yeah, let's apply this. Mm -hmm. What you sure? Want. Well, one uh, you know one component that you could add would be t for to have them identify what they didn't know as they were working through right. the case, mm -hmm. and then uh, that will that will serve two things. Number one, it'll highlight the areas that they need to learn more about, and it will redirect their work on the case if you do leave it open and allow them to go back. They have kind of a, a guided approach to, uh, to doing that. But I really like that as a kind of um, reformulation of productive failure. That's Let's great. That's how it goes, right? Yeah, excellent. Let me know. Well, I'm going to volunteer Neil after I talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I was, uh, the context in which I teach, I mentioned before that I teach uh, future language teachers. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, the graduate and undergraduate. So, all my courses, all the, uh, the papers the students have to write are based on essay questions. And I came up with this idea probably eight years ago. I don't provide feedback to students if they do not provide, if they don't read their papers first 
So I have a form that I have called uh, dialogical feedback. Mm -hmm. So they get my feedback as soon as they identified what are the three things that they want to change in their papers, how they are going to solve this. Interesting. So that forces, you you mentioned before the feedback, because I kill myself providing feedback and feedback and feedback, Mm -hmm. and the results were zero, right? Right. So this has been very productive for, for me, and the gentleman here mentioned that I'm very fortunate because I work with the students who have been self-selected. They want to be there. They are, I get them in their last uh, two years of their oh, teaching okay. career, sure. so that might be e- useful. But anyway, so that is one thing. And the other thing that uh, during your presentation is the, uh, the, the grades versus narratives. I taught for Braille of the School of English. I don't know if you're familiar with mm-hmm. that, but we didn't provide grades for our, our GUT students. We provided narratives. Right. And the problems we faced, and the problems they faced when they went to the job market is that people didn't want to hire them because they didn't have grades. They just had narratives. And right. Those are my two things. Thank you. Sure. Well, but, um, first of all, I love the, the feedback approach. Uh, I think that that's a that's a... It's almost like a pre-reflection because they're identifying their goals. So a lot of a lot of writing classes and even um, uh, non-humanities classes use a post-reflection assignment where the the part, the point of the assignment is for students to read the feedback and create a plan for how they'll utilize the feedback for future assignments. But what you're doing there is kind of a pre-reflection where they're identifying their goals and you're fitting your feedback into what they've already identified. So I really like that. Uh, the point about uh, these different grading models is a, is well taken. In fact, I had a good friend in grad school who went to a college. Uh, it's now defunct, which could say something about it. But it didn't give grades. It only gave narrative feedback. And he had a hard time getting into grad school. Um, but he did, right? Uh, because it, admissions offices were able to work on that. Um, so there are means for doing this. They're just, uh, at this point in time, a little bit harder. I expect that to change for two reasons. Number one, a lot of what we know now about employers, a lot of the the stuff that's coming out, uh, yes, they care about GPA, but they care about it less than they care about the development of these other skills, critical thinking, communication, right, Uh, on the assumption that if if you have those, we can teach you the other stuff, right? Uh, And so I think employers are uh, focused a little bit less on grades. Uh, The other thing, though, is that um, there are... Uh, admissions offices and there are ed tech companies that are already developing tools to translate narrative transcripts into traditional transcripts, right? This is happening uh, a lot on the K-12 to college side because there are many high schools that are starting to move towards standards-based grading and there are some companies that, as they always do, have stepped into the void to offer a solution to how to make that transition, right? But all that's to say, regardless of how you feel about ed tech, that there are possibilities for making that happen. But it's a really important point. There are no easy answers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you got volunteered. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, well, thank you. Um, so <laughs> when, I've, uh, when I have had, when I've taught, I usually teach either web development or instructional design. So, um, and there's always some kind of a, a summative, project or, or more along mm-hmm. the way. So sure. for me, I, I rely a lot on peer review, not because I think peers give good reviews because they usually don't, but I'll give some sort of low level um, points just for them to, to get it turned in for mm-hmm. peer review so that they get it done a little early. They have somebody else looking at it and I'll have them a lot of times, I'll have them posted on a discussion board so it's more open sure and more people see it and then that way they get to see kind of where their project sits in comparison to some of the others right and um and you get some feedback maybe it's good maybe it's not but at least for me then it gives me the ability to go through and see problems mm-hmm. and and it takes a little bit of pressure off of me to be like right on it Right. Giving deep feedback to everybody, but I can catch the, the major issues and mm-hmm. pull them out and say, hey, look out for this before you submit. So I'll usually try to get them to turn it in <coughs> to somebody 
once or twice right. before they actually turn it into me for a grade. And sure. the end product comes out better as a result. Okay, so building in uh, peer assessment, self-assessment, uh, these are really important uh, tools, I think, that we have. Uh, you know, a lot of people have been trying to solve the peer, uh, the peer review problem for a long time, and I don't think we've landed on a great model for it yet. But it does speak to the fact that uh, there are assignments that we can give that if structured properly, simply by doing them, without us needing to grade them or add work to our load, simply by doing them, they'll learn in the process. Now, it, we have to be very careful about how we structure it, but peer review is one. I think what, what most folks have found about peer review is it often benefits the person giving the review maybe a little bit more than the person receiving the review, the process of review. So, uh, great point. So what about number two here? How might you utilize some pedagogies of failure in the classroom? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> so I give to my students something that I call exam wrappers. Oh, and great. Yes, definitely. Wrappers? So it's just a reflection, three questions, a reflection on what went wrong, what went right, what needs to be changed for the next, next exam. Great. So they have to do it. They gain like a, like a very small number of points. I don't grade it. Mm -hmm. I tell them that I can look at it if they want me to, but I, I don't grade it. My question is, so that's one that I will continue using. Right. But um, I always debate if I should have them fill it out before or after they get the grade. So I changed that. I tried a right. thing, and like maybe I could do a little study, right? So like before and after. <laughs> it would be a great <laughs> study. You, uh, the wheels are already turning. Uh, yeah, it's like <laughs> oh, yeah. For that, yeah. Let's see how it changes, yes. right? And how it changes. Maybe it would be very productive to them. I just mm -hmm. want to overload them with like little right. tiny assignments. So that's my concern. But what do you think? Uh, I think that what well, you're going to get there. You're going to have pros and cons for both, right? The the. The pros for the non-graded condition are going to be that they will um, they'll be honest with themselves about their preparation and their uh, their level of knowledge going in. Right. Um, the con is that part of the feedback that you're giving may highlight things that they didn't even realize that that were tripping them up. Right. After the grade, though, all the the con is that. Uh, most of what they're saying are going to be directed to justifying the grade that you gave them, right? Oh, I guess, you know. Uh, and the pro, though, will be that they, uh, they have revealed to them some areas that they might not have recognized. So I think you get different information. I think you might get more beneficial information for them in the, the pre-grading process. Um, but either works. I mean, exam wrappers... Uh, are really useful strategies. I know a lot of folks in a lot of different disciplines use them for this kind of reflective component. Um, another, uh, uh, another thing that people are trying a lot more, uh, I've noticed over the last five to ten years with exams, are group exams uh, to highlight the, this value of trying things out. And the model changes depending on who wants to use it. Uh, but uh, the, I, the basic idea is you take it once as an individual and then again as a group. Sometimes they'll average the grades. Sometimes they'll weight the grades differently. Uh, it's the same test on the assumption that you're going to identify what it is that you didn't know, and your peers are going to help you fill in those gaps, and you'll be able to help uh, your peers fill in those gaps, and you're heightening the learning that's happening uh, to a level that you wouldn't have otherwise just taking it by yourself. So uh, exams have become this interesting frontier for experimenting with some of these strategies. Great. Yes. I, two days ago, did a discussion on small teaching right. and just little small activities you can do. And I committed to investigate uh, making predictions. And I think this is a great spot to throw in failure. You know, here's it. We'll go up to a point. You make a prediction about what's going to happen next. Mm hmm I don't care if you're right or wrong. It doesn't matter. But, you know, you've got to think about where we're, you know, what's going to happen next and by thinking about what already happened. And then, you know, see what happens next and then examine 
your prediction in terms of, you know, where was it wrong? Where was it right? Sure. And no, just if there's some way of taking out the the grade, the points, the you know, it's okay to make a failure. You've you've you know, you were thinking. Okay? Right. Points for thinking. <laughs> points for putting your pencil on the paper type right. thing. Definitely. Yeah. And so, well, that's what some of these newer grading models really emphasize. Now, as with every single teaching decision that we make, uh, one thing is a trade-off for another thing. And so to revamp your grading model, what you are, what, there are some things that, that you may give up in order to really embrace that, right? And so you may, for example, it, uh, contract grading is one of these newer models. And so a contract grading system, if you do these 15 things, you'll get an A. If you do 12 of them, you'll get a B. Nine of them, you get a C. Now, uh, to adopt that model of grading, you really have to buy into the fact that students will learn by completing that activity uh, to a satisfactory level, right? Now, that's a trade-off of evaluating a product to see that it, measure, that it meets an A, B, or C level, but it gives a kind of freedom to, I'm giving you the, the points for learning uh, as, you were term, uh, as you were explaining it, right? So one, you're always making trade-offs, but hopefully those decisions are rooted in what you believe is best for your students in terms of their learning. I think we have one here, yes. So one idea I've been thinking about is when a student does really poorly on an assignment, give them an opportunity to redo it mm -hmm. and earn some or all the points back. But you know, one concern I have is if they know that that's going to happen, then they don't try the first time and they get personal coaching on the other one, which would be great, but I've got way too many students to do that. My grade <laughs> can barely keep up as it is. Right. So I don't know. Is that a valid concern? Would that be a better model to go to? Maybe I can hire some more TAs or something. Right. Well, yeah, this is the, the I mean, this conundrum has been around for a long time, right? Um, so I think... Uh, there, there are checks that you can put in place. So some people address the question that you're talking about by scaffolding the writing assignment uh, over the course of a longer period of time. So you're turning in pieces of it and getting some feedback, no grade, but feedback on those pieces before you turn in the final project. So that by putting in those checkpoints, you're ensuring that you're getting a good solid effort on the final version that so that and the reason for that is that then when you are giving the grade, you can ensure that people have put their best foot forward and those who are getting poor grades need that extra step. Uh, others do it by um, putting some sort of grade on the first version, a, a draft version, a full length version that you get so that you can be sure that the revisions will be taken seriously along the way. So there are things that you can do, but I wouldn't, uh, I would have some checks in place for your own time uh, and, uh, and to also maximize the value for them of, do, of going through that process. If they're just turning it, oh, well, he's going to let me do it over anyway. I'll just give him two pages worth of nonsense, right? Then it hasn't fulfilled at all the goals that you had hoped. So, so there, there are definitely kind of checkpoints along the way that you can build in. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we in the past have done an in-person assignment where the students are asked to make a prediction on the topic they're learning about that day that they haven't learned that content yet and kind of making prediction based on what their past knowledge okay. is. Okay, interesting. Um, and they just get a mark based on whether or not they completed it. Um, and then after they take it home, most of the assignment is uh, we ask them to use bold, italics, and underline to kind of look at what they got correct, where they maybe were on the right track, but mm -hmm. off a little bit, and things that they were incorrect on. And most of the points were associated with, like, the reflection on oh, good. Kind okay. of what the patterns of thinking were. Sure. Um, and we were talking about how to kind of push some of these things online for hybrid or completely online courses. Because mm -hmm. um, that's something that feels a lot easier when you're in class with the students and you can kind of right. give them assurances when they're looking at you and being like, I have no idea. We haven't talked about this yet. Right. <laughs> um, and so, I don't know, we were talking a little bit about maybe doing a two-part discussion where you start a discussion before they watch the lecture on it and then going back and kind of responding to themselves or to other students. But I was wondering if you had any um, 
if you had any experience with kind of how to provide that support not in a face-to-face class. Right. Well, it's, it's obviously much trickier, and people are trying to crack the nut of uh, um, social presence and building teacher and student presence into online and hybrid. Um, and many of these strategies depend on that, uh, that presence and that trust between everyone in the learning community. Um, I do like uh, a model that's, kind of, uh, that's uh, similar to what you were describing, which is a, a structured discussion. Uh, you can begin with a question that they don't know the answer to uh, and then have them engage in the activities and then come back to the question and provide a different answer and, and uh, have the grade be based on the attempt and the learning that is displayed between the two attempts. And what I, what I really like about that model is that it also plugs into uh, the research that we have on curiosity as a driver of learning. Uh, because one thing that we know in that condition is if you ask uh, any group of people a question, a, a good question, to ponder and then don't give them the answer, their brains are primed the entire time you're with them to listen to what you're telling them to figure out the answer to that question, right? Uh, and, you know, that's something that, that neuroscientists have found. That's something that biologists have found. It's just a, a, a make, uh, the way we're made up in many ways, right? And so that strategy in the online environment replicates the same process. Um, and it can be spread out over days, right, uh, depending on how long the assignment is open. Or it can happen in a, synchro in a synchronous environment as well. Well, I think it uh, looks like we're up against the time. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me, and thanks for these great ideas that you've come up with. Thanks a lot. <laughs>